Greetings everyone. Today we are going to talk to Konstantin Yefremov. He entered Ukraine some time ago as part of the Russian occupation army. After staying here for a while, he realized he had to leave. Next, he will tell everything himself. Konstantin, did I say it right? Yes, right. That's right. Then please tell me. Starting not even from the 24th of February, 2022, but in general from the beginning of February, what was going on? Where did you serve? What were you talking about? When did you find out that you, or your unit, were going to Ukraine? At the time of February, which was by the 10th of February, I arrived in the Crimea, for the so-called exercise. I was a platoon commander of an infantry battalion, part of the 42nd Motorized Rifle Division. And as for the talk, everyone said they didn't believe there was going to be a war or that there was going to be some kind of invasion. And I'm sure even the high-ranking commanders didn't know anything about it either. When we arrived at the range, there was no training, we just lived there. And then we moved from the Angersk Polygon in Crimea a little north to the village of Junkoy. And on that very day, the 24th of February, early in the morning, I heard the roar of artillery, rocket-propelled artillery. And all questions disappeared on their own, that is, it became clear that war had begun. I saw the branding of military equipment, putting this Z mark on it. I went up to my commander, directly to the battalion commander, and I expressed to him my desire to resign. He took me to the division chief of staff, Colonel Sanko. I voiced my position to him. In response, he told me that I was a traitor, a coward, a deserter, that he would put me in jail. In general, he called me the most vile names. I went out silently, did not listen to what he had to say, handed over my machine gun and got into a cab. And I left with a firm determination to quit and not be a part of it. I had already been in the armed forces for nine and a half years at that point. That's my seniority. During this time I was not involved in the annexation of Crimea or in the armed conflict in Donbass, nor was I on mission in Syria. I tried to avoid it because of my personal convictions. From the year 2018 to the present, I have been the commander of a demining platoon. That was my service in recent years. I cleared mines in the Chechen Republic and was satisfied with my work. I didn't think of myself as a mooch. When I got in a cab and left the place where we were stationed, where the division headquarters was, I started getting calls from my fellow soldiers. Colonel Sayenko lined up my fellow soldiers, explained to them that I was a traitor and that he would put me in jail, and that he had sent the military police after me. And all my information was handed over to the Russian internal affairs officers. And at that time, already at the exit of the peninsula and at the Crimean Bridge, along the highway at all intersections, the prosecutor's office and the military police were already on duty. They were checking the documents of all the servicemen. I started calling a lawyer, trying to find a way out of this situation. And the military lawyer said that I had to write a report. But this can only be done at the permanent deployment point in the city of Grozny. At that time I did not understand what was the best thing to do, what was the best thing to do. I am not making excuses for myself, nor am I whitewashing myself. Now I realize that I should have at least tried to leave, no matter what. And in the end, when I quit after three months of my stay in Ukraine, I lost both my savings and my good salary. But it certainly wasn't worth it to be there for three months. I blame myself for it, I can't forgive myself for it. And I hope that was the first and last time I've ever been a coward in my life and made such a mistake.
Now I will try to correct this mistake. Because I really believe that I am guilty of daring to cross the border of a sovereign state with a weapon in my hands. Constantine. Do I understand correctly that you are already ready to testify to investigators, both foreign and Ukrainian? I'm fully prepared. As far as I understand, you served in Chechnya. Yes. That is, it is a place of permanent deployment. Yes. How did you end up in Crimea, and why? We were sent to Crimea for exercises, but before that, I had been promoted from the position of mine clearance platoon commander to the position of rifle platoon commander of the combined battalion. Three such battalions were created just before the exercise. Why this was done and for what purpose, I can't know, I don't know. You say, I was a coward, but I went there anyway. Tell me more about what month, what day it was, or if possible where exactly you were sent. So, I stopped at the point where I took a cab and drove away, and started calling looking for a connection with some lawyer. After I talked to him, I did not receive any intelligible instructions. After that, I had to go back to Junkoi. That's where I tried to hand in my report to my commanders. And I tried to go through that whole procedure to be allowed to leave. But, of course, nobody would let me go anywhere. On February 27th, the command was given to move closer to the borders. We got in our cars and drove. When we reached the border, we did not stop, but directly crossed it. So without stopping we reached a military airfield near Melitopol. And there I saw the first cases of looting. I saw how the convoy stopped, and the soldiers started jumping out of it, going into some special back rooms of the airfield. And the airfield, by the way, was completely destroyed by bombs. The planes and the flight control center were on fire. Then these servicemen took away all kinds of useless junk, like lawnmowers, some buckets. So you a professional and expert in the field of demining, were assigned to be the commander of a rifle platoon or rifle company. Is that what you said? Rifle platoon. Yes, a rifle platoon. What was your reaction to that? I think this is complete nonsense. I asked my engineer battalion commander what the hell was going on. He tells me that everything is normal, you will be there in the rear. I see. But on the 27th of February you realized that you were going specifically to Ukraine. Yes. No options. Yes. And did everyone know? Everyone knew. In Melitopol the airfield was destroyed. And then what? It must have been during the week or so of the six days we were there. Then we were assigned to groups. The members of this combined battalion, including myself, were assigned as follows. One officer and subordinate personnel, ten to eight men, to guard the artillery. And in one such group, among all of them, I was appointed commander. Then, on March 3rd, we were sent to the artillerymen. They brought us in, dropped us off, and told us to guard. It was a division of three, Urigan, units and two 203mm, Pion, guns. All this was taking place to the south of the Orohovo settlement which is located in Zaporizhia Oblast, and slightly north of the Tokmak settlement. They didn't welcome us there. We were like an extra burden to them, considering that there were 70 of them, and now there would be 10 more. So, for more than a month, we lived apart. That is, they gave us some food, water, and other things, but on a very small scale. And we just hunted hares, cooked our own food, and lived in the forest. What about your principle of, we don't leave our own behind? There is no such principle. Ah, there is no such principle. I see, but in your posters it exists. And how long did it last? About 40 days. Maybe more. 
maybe less. And what interesting things happened during those 40 days? One day, while on another hare hunt and walking long distances on foot, we came across a very large, just a huge mansion right in the middle of the fields. We approached this house and saw a Russian soldier there, and we decided to ask this soldier if we could ever come and bathe in this house. He told us, yes, there is water here, you can come and have a swim. We came, went inside and saw that about a dozen or so soldiers of the 100th Mazdok Brigade were living there. I don't remember exactly whether they were motorized riflemen or not. I know for a fact that they were the 100th Mazdok Brigade. By the time we got there for the first time, they had already ransacked the whole house, i.e. it was a huge mansion of an obviously very rich man. But on the territory where his house was, there were also all kinds of outbuildings, various machinery, and very expensive tractors from John Deere were also there. It was obvious to us that all of his activities were related to land, crops, and agriculture. There was also a grain grinder and a pigsty. And there was also his dwelling house where he apparently lived. And these servicemen were living there for a while. They tore the whole house apart, even tried to break into a safe. They were feasting in the kitchen. So you could survive anything in that house, any kind of disaster, even nuclear war. There was also a carp pond with Japanese carps called koi. So these servicemen fished them all out and ate them. But they are not meant to be eaten. Exactly. Normal people keep these carps as pets in their homes, and don't use them for food. And by the way, there was a wine cellar, so those soldiers drank everything there. That is, they felt at home, they were very comfortable and they did not deny themselves anything, they even ate these ornamental fish. I heard that no one ate these fish in Japan, even when there was a time of severe famine. Yes. That's right, nobody ever eats these carps in Japan. Anyway, on the 16th of April we stopped this task because we had a quarrel with the chief of staff of this artillery brigade. And he told us to leave and called our composite battalion commander and told him to pick up his fighters. Later, a Kamaz truck came to pick us up and we left for Belmag. There in Belmac we were in some repair area, where farm equipment was repaired, there were hangars with grain, and there were garages and an office building where the documentation of all activities was kept. And so the headquarters of the rear of the 42nd Division was established in this area, with Colonel Shapag as its chief officer. This man is the division deputy commander for the military political part. And then my subordinates and I, and there were eight of them, were assigned the task of guarding the territory and dealing with the pass regime at the checkpoint, at the entrance gate. One day the internet went down. Then it turned out that when fighting was going on in Mariupol, the 36th Brigade of the Marine Corps of the Armed Forces of Ukraine was surrounded. And, as far as I know, they defended the Ilyich plant, which is next to the Azovstal plant, and decided to break out of this encirclement. I heard there were about 200, 250 people there. They all broke into several groups of 10 to 15 people and fled from there. Some were able to break out of the encirclement, some died breaking out of there. And as time passed, I learned that one of these groups had been captured. And such information surfaced that all these groups had to go out to certain addresses of certain settlements, and call a certain telephone number. When this became known, they turned off the internet in the area. After the internet was turned off, 
these groups started to be caught, captured, detained. And so the three captive soldiers were brought to the division rear headquarters, where I was, and Colonel Shapag too. What kind of people did these captives seem like to you? I understood that they were defending their land. I would defend my land, too, if my country was attacked. I get it. And how did Russian officers or Russian soldiers treat them? Everyone considered them nationalists. Everyone considered them Banderites and other names like that. Were they tortured? Or were they beaten? Yes. Colonel Shapaga and Major Dutov, the commander of that composite battalion in which I was serving at the time, interrogated these three prisoners. And, as far as I know, they were interrogating at least 20 more prisoners of war from the same brigade who were in other settlements nearby. Colonel Shapag interrogated them. Also, for example, he demanded from each of these POWs the names of nationalists. That is, he would say, who in your battalion is a nationalist? Tell me his last name. Who is the nationalist in your company? And the POWs could not answer any of these questions, they did not understand what they were talking about. They answered him. We are military personnel. We're not some battalion or private military company or whatever. We're just regular, full-time soldiers. Our purpose is to defend our country, and we've never encountered anything like this before. And he would beat them in response. Major Dutov had a wooden bat, he would jump up and start hitting them on the legs, knees, fingers. These interrogations lasted for hours, after which they were brought back to the garage and locked there in the garage. Do I understand correctly that the interrogation of Ukrainian cadres by Russian officers was to beat the names of nationalists out of them? Yes, that was Colonel Shapaga's main leitmotif. The most frequent question he asked and demanded an answer was the names of the nationalists. Of course, he would ask what their positions were and how many soldiers they had. He also asked them all other formal questions. One guy honestly admitted that his position was that of a sniper. When the colonel heard this, it was as if he went insane, completely lost his mind. He started taking all his aggression, all his anger out on this guy. I know he was born in the year 1939. Colonel Shapaga asked him during the interrogation, how many have you killed? The sniper answered that he did not know, he had shot three times and missed twice. He hit once, but he did not know whether he had killed the man or not, it was impossible to confirm that for sure. The colonel responded by beating him. The interrogations lasted for about a week, at least. And every day Colonel Shapaga would get drunk and call a soldier to watch the prisoners. He would bring them in, they were blindfolded. From this soldier sniper he could pull down his pants and ask, are you married or do you have a girlfriend? The sniper would say, I have a girlfriend. The colonel would reply, now we're going to put a mop in you and send the video to your girlfriend. Or he could shout out things like, now I'm going to call a Dagestani and he's going to rape you, and we're going to film it and send it to your girlfriend. I don't know why he mentioned that ethnicity. But it didn't come to that. This colonel was getting very drunk every time, and it made him lose his mind, literally go crazy. Okay, I get it. I'll ask now, just so I don't forget. How many Russian servicemen supported the actions of this colonel? Well, in the area where we were specifically, 70 to 80 percent. Approximately so. 80 percent means everything's fine, everything's good, right? So they can be treated the same way here, right? They like to be treated that way. You know, Vladimir, those people who were there, they weren't on the front lines for a single day. 
They were in the rear the whole time. And they were all trying to break through, to get past this guy who was guarding the prisoners in the garage, to hit them, to talk to them, to insult them. And one time there was such an incident. A soldier came into the garage and kicked this sniper guy in the face. So he broke his nose. What happened next? What do you know? When a Kamaz truck came to pick them up, it took them to Melitopol. Both military and civilian prisoners were held there. The driver said that they were also beaten there, and they found out that the guy was a sniper and started treating him with particular cruelty. The sniper asked them during the interrogation. What makes me different from the shooter? Why do you hate me so much? Why do you beat me up so much? I told you everything I knew. Colonel Shapaga, while drunk, would take out his pistol, put it to the sniper's head, and tell him he was going to count to three. He would count to three and shoot him next to the head, or under his feet. What's the matter with the colonel now? He was promoted. From the position of deputy division commander to some army position in the 58th Army. I think this is typical of the Russian army. Were there facts of looting? Yes, there were. There were times when they took cars away, stole them. There were times when they bought them, but at a low price, and that was very rare. They lived in the abandoned houses of ordinary citizens. All these citizens' houses were vandalized. There was also a household chemical warehouse, as I remember, and this household chemical warehouse was also raided. The main question for you today. How did you manage to leave the army and get out? When I was still in the village of Belmak, there for those who tried to resign, to refuse service, Colonel Shapag made a prison, an improvised brig in the school building in Belmak. Constantine, if you wish, you can add something from yourself, tell us something else. What would you like to add? I would like to address those servicemen who are now in the trenches. I want to tell you that this is a very big mistake. And I myself made that mistake and partially corrected it. Now I have no intention of hiding at all. I put myself in the public eye, although I could have remained completely anonymous and no one would have known anything about me. I could have given some testimony in silence and lived quietly abroad. But I did it consciously. I feel guilty for being cowardly at the time, and now I will try to communicate as much as possible with all the media and urge Russian soldiers to return from there. I want to appeal to all the mobilized, and to the potential mobilized. I want to appeal to those who are now in the trenches. You have absolutely nothing to do there. Even if your moral part is weak and you can't sympathize at all, at least save your own skin and get out of there. I was already interviewed by Vladimir Osechkin, and there I also addressed Russian servicemen, I said all this. And I am ready to give a hundred more interviews like that, even a thousand more. There's nothing waiting for you there but death, disgrace and curses. I just can't get it out of my head. For example, sometimes I'm at home on the phone with my mother. And she calls me on the phone and tells me these things, like that she talked to her friend, and they got a summons to the army. And they immediately bought a bulletproof vest, they bought pouches, they bought good t-shirts. You are not normal, you are sick people. In that case, buy yourself a place in the cemetery at once, buy yourself a coffin at once. 
We in Russia are so used to living in this slavery. Already this slave nature has permeated our genes to such an extent that people are even willing to go to die as slaves themselves. There is no Russian army now. The Russian army is those people who refused to fight. Here they still somehow remained partially faithful to their oath. But those who are there now in the trenches and call themselves the Ministry of Defense are not the Ministry of Defense. This is the private military company of the cooperative Ozero, is the private military company of Putin and his lackeys, no different from Wagner and the rest of the rabble. I take it that Russians are better off solving their own problems, not ours. The Russians had a lot of time on their hands and we didn't do it. If there's anything else you want to say to Ukrainians, you can say it. Yes. I want to apologize for entering your country with a gun in my hand. I think it was the biggest mistake of my life, and I will try to make it up to you as best I can. Thank you, Constantine, for your candor, and for the story you told us today. Thank you very much, and goodbye. Goodbye.